This is the last session of our series in chronic edema and lymphedema. And I'm pleased that you're all here rather than outside in the nice warm weather that we finally have. So I'm, I'm really honored that you did choose to come and listen to the sessions tonight. Tonight we have uh, four speakers for you and um, the first two ladies that are speaking, uh, I'll introduce them and they'll tell you a little bit more about what they're talking about. And uh, then um, after that we have Ian Souls coming again to, to talk a little bit to us and Dr. Rao uh, will be also talking to us. So Heather Watt uh, graduated from the University of Alberta with a Bachelor of Science in Occupational Therapy in 2000. Since then, she has worked in various positions within Alberta Health Services, mainly in community rehabilitation. She has been treating lymphedema for the past five years, and in March 2013, she became a certified lymphedema therapist through the Norton School of Lymph Lymphatic Therapy. And joining her tonight is Darla Larson, and Darla is a, um, a graduate of McEwen um, in 2002 with the Diploma in Physical Therapy. And Darla also works with, uh, with Heather, and she is also a certified lymphedema uh, therapist. So I'll let them go ahead and uh, start tonight. So. Thank you very much. So thanks for having us. Um, so we're, uh, as Shirley said, we're from the Community Rehab Interdisciplinary Service. So we call it the Chris Clinic. And um, we're going to be talking to you a little bit about what our clinic provides. And then we're going to, um, originally we were asked to present some case studies. So we have a few case studies that, uh, of clients that we've treated that we're going to present and um, hopefully find interesting. So Chris is an ambulatory rehab service for adults with complex rehab needs. So we're an allied health program under Alberta Health Services. So we have a multidisciplinary um, team, occupational therapists, physical therapists, speech language pathologists, we have a recreation therapist and a social worker. So this part of our clinic, um, we see people with MS, um, Parkinson's, stroke, people with chronic progressive disease. Um, for the last almost five years, we have implemented lymphedema services into our clinic. So um, we treat lymphedema that is not caused by cancer. People that do have cancer-related um, lymphedema, we're referring to the Cross Cancer Institute. Um, and this was just felt to be a huge need in the community to um, specifically have that treatment for non-cancer-related lymphedema. <clears throat> so most of those people with non-cancer-related are lower extremity edemas that we're seeing. Um, Myself, I'm an occupational therapist and Darla is a therapy assistant. We're both certified lymphedema therapists for about a year now. And um, it's just the two of us running this clinic, the lymphedema clinic. So we see clients that are referred by a physician. We'll also accept referrals from ET nurses or uh, nurse practitioners. Most importantly, we just want that physician or the family physician know that the client is coming to our clinic and going to be seen for assessment and treatment of lymphedema. <clears throat> Again, we treat non-cancer related lymphedema and we well, if we get those referrals, we well kind of look at their history and make sure that um, a referral to the cross is appropriate. Um, we do uh, prefer that our clients be cognitively able to comply with treatment. It's really, really important. We teach a lot of self-management um, with this condition and we need them to be cognitively intact. And we do treat people like that, but often they have a caregiver that comes with them and ensures that the treatment we're providing is safe for them. Um, and most importantly, we need our clients to be willing to wear compression lifelong. So that's a discussion that we have right off the bat. And you know, if that's not, if they're not willing to do that right now, we kind of postpone treatment and maybe it's, it's not the best thing for, for them right now. So this is what we provide at our clinic. We are going to discuss all these um, points in more detail. So we do do a full lower leg in assessment, in including the assessment of circulation. We obtain a very comprehensive medical history. This helps us to determine the course of therapy. 
Um, we do treatment, active treatment to reduce lymphedema. We can provide compression garments. So we look at, are able to recommend daytime and nighttime compression garments. Um, and again, most importantly, we're providing a lot of education on long-term management, self-management of lymphedema. Are you having trouble hearing me? <laughs> Sorry, is this the phone here? How's, how's that? Better? Okay, sorry about that. Um, and we are able to uh, provide yearly follow-ups for our clients and we implemented this so that we can ensure that our clients are maintaining the reduction that we achieved with active treatment. And again, sorry, we'll discuss that further. Okay, so active treatment, or you may have heard this as described as phase one lymphedema treatment. We, our main um, treatment is compression. So we use two types of low stretch bandages. Um, the, we have two options. The first is a two layer compression system that we can apply twice a week. <coughs> we only are treating clients to two days per week. So it does limit, that's one of the limiting factors in what type of bandage that we can apply to our clients. And we also, um, consider a reusable compression bandage and this is for clients that are able to bandage themselves. Um, the clients that we see very infrequently are able to bandage themselves because they're usually quite overweight and would have extreme difficulty reaching their feet and being able to, to do that bandaging for themselves. So there's a lot of factors that go into why we choose either of those um, compression, we have to look at what this person is doing day to day, do they need to wear shoes, do they need to drive, are they working, is their work very active, so um, we, we do obtain a good history to make that decision for them and have that discussion with them on what they feel is going to be easy to do for them in their life. So every session we measure the client's leg, just circumfer circumferential measurements up the leg to measure, monitor the reduction. We do skin care, um, make sure there's, uh, the skin is healthy. We do have access to a nurse through home care. They're conveniently located across the hall from us. So they have been more than willing to help us out because we're definitely not trained in, <laughs> in wound care. So, um, and they are excellent and they've actually allowed us to see a lot more clients. Um, than we would have been able to without them. So it's a great, great service for us. Um, again, really important, we teach a home exercise program. We even have clients check off that they're doing it regularly. We encourage walking, strengthening exercises in the legs, and deep breathing exercises. And, and that's, again, just to further in stimulate that lymphatic system. Um, we. We are trained in manual lymph drainage. We don't, it's not part of our regular treatment. We kind of use it as we feel it's necessary. So go on a case by case basis for that. <clears throat> and again, during active treatment, we're constantly <laughs> talking about lymphedema management, self-management. We want our clients to be self-managers of this condition when we're done. Um, and it's just an extremely important skill to have. So we're constantly talking about compression, that they will have to wear compression stockings, that they might have to wear a compression garment at night, that they will have to maintain good skin care, they will have to continue exercising, maintaining a healthy weight, eating a healthy diet, and possibly um, go for manual lymph drainage regularly. All right, I'm gonna pass it on to Darla. So the second phase of lymphedema treatment is what we call the maintenance phase and we start thinking about the maintenance phase as soon as we meet that client because we need to make sure that they understand that once we're finished treating them that there's this whole other side to things that they have to kind of agree to or, or be willing to adhere to. Um, so once their edema reduction plateaus, we have them measured for the appropriate compression garment. Um, in our clinic, we bring those vendors to us to do those measurements, and we do that because we like to get measurements the same day that they go in their garments. That's when we feel we've got their leg down the most. Um, 
we work a lot with the vendors to kind of determine what garment's going to work best for that client. There's lots of different options out there. They know about the garments and how to measure, but we know the person's limb and how they've responded to treatment. Um, and those garments take three weeks to get in. They're made in Germany usually, and so the clients have to be managed until the garments come in. Um, Heather is actually able to authorize through Alberta A's to Daily Living if the client doesn't have funding or, or benefits to cover those. Um, so it's easy for us to kind of get that going and, and get those garments on the way. We are thinking about nighttime throughout treatment as well because we're much better now at kind of determining if we feel the client's going to need nighttime compression. Many people that we see aren't going to be maintained in just their daytime stocking. They get refill in those stockings and without a nighttime compression, they often end up failing those stockings after about a month. So if we, you know, most of our clients, our larger clients, most of them have had long-standing lymphedema and so we know that that nighttime compression is necessary and so we need to start thinking about it before the stockings arrive because we can't send them home in their stockings without that second added piece. That's what's going to really help them be successful. Um, so once our stockings come in and we're happy with you know, the fit, we make sure that they know how to get them on, they can get them off, or they have support to do that, because that's kind of crucial as well. If they can't get them on correctly, they're not going to work very well. And if everything's going good, we'll leave them for a week and then monitor them to see if those garments are working. Um, you know, Once we're satisfied they are, then we can kind of leave them for about six weeks. If they're not working well, then we have more problems to solve because we need to make sure that everything is going well before we stop seeing that client. So at the six week visit, we'll make sure that they're happy with their garment, they're getting them on and off properly. They leave that day with a piece of paper that actually outlines exactly what we're expecting from them, what we think they're going to be wearing up daytime and nighttime. We review again, you know, you still need to exercise. It's not okay now to stop just because you're in your garments. There's lots of those pieces. Weight management, we always go over that from the beginning. Um, and we recommend in that, in that sheet that if, they, if it's possible for them to go for maintenance massage from somebody who's certified in lymphatic drainage, it would be really helpful in just increasing their being successful. Um, and then if everything's going great, we'll follow up with them yearly. Our super complex clients may be a little bit more often than that, but for the most part, now that we've kind of gotten them all those pieces of paper and they can go home with it, we're able to follow most of them once a year. So the next topic for us to bring up is uh, obesity management. Um, it's something we figured out very early was going to be a huge component for our clinic. Um, we see a lot of clients coming through our door that, that have swelling that we believe is secondary to their weight. It's not every client for sure, but um, we kind of have to tease that out a bit because in our experience, we've struggled a little bit with this client and actually being able to, to treat them and maintain them. Um, we can't say exactly why that, that these clients have the lymphedema, but we can surmise that you know they have a lot of extra tissue, their venous systems don't work as, as well, then in turn their lymphatic system is compromised. So they're often a combination of edemas. Um, we can surmise that they have a lot of weight around their midsection, maybe a lot of pressure on those nodes, and it's difficult for fluids to, to exit their system. They're often not very physically active either. So there's a lot of factors that kind of contribute to it. Um, and in our experience, we found that the management of their lymphedema is extremely difficult. You know, we can wrap these clients, but often we're just moving the problem around because, again, we're struggling to get it to actually leave their system. Um, there's a lot of risk to wrapping them when they're heavier. They're at increased risk for cardiac concerns, but they're also more prone to having that fluid pool in places that we can't then treat it very well. So we wrap their lower leg, it pools in their thigh. You wrap the thigh, it pools in their abdomen. Um, so every person that comes in is going to get that assessment, and our job is to kind of sit down and tease out with the medical history, looking at their legs. We look at risk factors. Do they have wounds? Have they had wounds? Um, have they, do they have a history of cellulitis? If they're really low risk and, they're, and they're, they look pretty healthy, we've added a component of weight loss to our lymphedema clinic just because of the number of these patients that we're seeing. So Heather and I both recently went and had some additional training in supporting people with weight loss um, because we know from the people that we've tried to treat that we're failing these people in treatment. We can, we can get that fluid out sometimes. We might even be lucky enough that it doesn't sit somewhere we don't want it, but then we can't keep it out. 
right? We've got them in stockings, it's not holding them. Many of them can't afford to buy those garments that are needed for nighttime control. And so they go through all of this wrapping and then they're failing in that maintenance phase very quickly. So if they're low risk, um, we definitely want to keep seeing them. We both wanted to get a lot better at knowing what's out there for resources and how do we help them? How do we talk with them? How do we support them? We've had every single client agree to being referred to a weight loss program, but there's weights for that as well. And so, you know, we want to make sure that we're not sending them out that door. So they come back in for regular visits. We monitor their skin. We monitor their swelling. We set weight loss goals. And I mean, so far it's been really successful. Um, and we've had a really good response in building a relationship with these clients. So hopefully, as we're following them and they get referred to a program and they start down that road, we can start treating them. That's, that's really what we want to do. Um, and it's made us a lot more aware of what's out there for these clients as far as support and whatnot. So that's just a new thing that we've added in the last few months. And um, hopefully it's going to grow a little bit in our clinic because I think there is a real big need to address that problem and especially in relation to lymphedema. All right, so as I mentioned before, we're gonna present a, a three case studies of clients that we have treated at our clinic. And we do have pictures. Here's one. <laughs> so this is Diane. Um, hopefully I don't call her by her real name. <laughs> so this is how she came to us. Um, this is a picture of her from behind. So she's a 66 year old female. She reported about an 18 year history of swelling in her legs with recurring wounds. She thought that the edema started about 18 years ago after an infection. Um, and that's something that we often hear because a cellulitis or an infection in the skin will damage the lymphatic system more and uh, that just makes the condition worse. And that's why skin care is so, so, so important in managing lymphedema. So her skin was very poor. Uh, the picture before, she had a lot of blistering or like skin projections and some of them filled with fluid. Um, again, they would burst and she'd have wounds and then home care would be in um, trying to help with that. She had numerous attempts at um, compression wrapping. She was only ever wrapped to the knee. They tried all sorts of things and you would, it, it was scary actually what she came in. She came in wrapped in fleece, pieces of fleece. With duct tape. <laughs> and it was just because she was so frustrated that this is what worked for her, this is what was comfortable with her. Um, but yeah, it was a little bit scary. Um, but it really was, she was from out of town, like uh, about five hours out of Edmonton. So she did have to relocate to Edmonton to get this treatment. Um, but they just didn't know how to treat this condition. Um, her mobility was severely impaired. She had to use a scooter for long distances. She was able to ambulate or walk within her home, um, but very short distances. Her weight was about 319 pounds when she was about 5'2", so um, I haven't calculated that BMI, but it's probably a little bit high. So we can, we can suspect that this is probably a lymphedema secondary to her weight. And these cellulitis and infections. So this is her after treatment. So we just have a few stats here. Um, we put, we used um, the two layer compression system and wrapped her twice a week um, to, the th to the thigh. So, and by thigh I mean groin. So <laughs> we get right up there. Um, and if we don't, then the, the swelling just kind of goes right over the top of the wrap. So we did 12 wraps, which is six weeks basically, on her right leg and nine on her left leg. We removed 9.6 liters of fluid. So it's almost five two liter milk jugs and seven liters from her left leg. Her weight um, reduced to 308 pounds post treatment. So a lot of that was fluid and regardless of that, this lady really, really has to work on her weight management. Um, she is someone that we could not wait to lose weight because of her skin condition. It was just too risky. So we, we really felt like she needed this treatment. So to maintain this reduction, she's gonna have to do all the work now. Um, so she needs to wear custom 
thigh high stockings during the day and for her we had a chap style so they actually come up to the thigh and then have a hip portion and actually attach so we've just found that that helps with the stockings to stay up a little bit better absolutely she has to wear a compression garment at night this was a very expensive garment for her for both legs i think it was about a thousand dollars and that's actually inexpensive for nighttime compression she will absolutely have to continue to lose weight or at least maintain her weight. She has to stay active. She has to maintain her skin health. We reduce the edema and cause, all, cause more skin creases and more areas for uh, things to grow. So we really do a lot of training and make sure that clients can wash and dry in their skin creases and make sure those stay healthy. She also, all those blisters and skin projections that she had, some of them actually went away but some of them ended up as skin tags. And so those, again, are gonna be a source of infection, a source of um, problems for her with the shearing forces of putting stockings on and stuff. So um, unfortunately, we haven't been able to follow up with this lady yet. We're gonna see her in June, so I'm really excited to see how well she's doing. And again, she, is, um, she does know someone from her hometown who is a, a certified in manual lymph drainage, so she is, um, going to try and do that regularly so that's really great all right so this is just a before and after picture of her we're pretty proud of this one we're actually proud of all of ours <laughs> <laughs> and darling. so this is Paula um, we tried to pick a few different ones um, from what we see I mean like I said in the earlier talk we do see a lot of clients that have swelling um, that is most likely secondary to their weight. But because we're treating non-cancer related lymphedema, we see pretty much anybody else that gets swelling out there that isn't able to be seen for that. Um, she's 58 year old female with a four year history of swelling in her left leg only. She did have a wound in her left leg and had actually been treated with, it, with compression for her swelling and the wound, and it healed the wound. They put her in stockings, things were going well, but um, she, she wasn't maintained and again, she was in a below knee stocking, probably needed a thigh high. She didn't have nighttime compression. So there was probably a couple of reasons why those stockings failed. Um, but they healed her wound and you know it was a start. So when she came to us, she actually wasn't wearing anything on that left leg. Um, it was an interesting one for us because previous doctors on the referral had actually thought that perhaps uh, they queried filariasis, which is not something we would expect to see. It's the leading cause of lymphedema in the world, but it's mostly seen in third world countries. It's a parasite that's carried by a mosquito, and if a person's infected, it actually damages the lymphatic system. The larvae are, are in there actually damaging the system. I think they queried it with her just because she actually had been in some countries where that was a possibility, and there really isn't medically any kind of an event that would have triggered this, so it was just interesting to us. It doesn't change the treatment, but you know, you read about these things when you go through training, so it's just kind of interesting to see somebody that they actually think that that could happen. It didn't help her get any tests for lymphedema. They typically don't do a lot of that here, um, which we would love to see changed, actually. <laughs> so we wrapped her nine times, and we removed four liters of fluid, which is a little bit more dramatic if you could see her because she's not five feet tall. She's a little tiny lady, and so there was a lot of fluid in that leg that she was packing around and you know, working all of her jobs, and it didn't slow her down, but it was definitely a, a big hindrance to her, and she just, even with still being in bandages because her garments haven't arrived, she says she notices quite a difference to just walking with that leg. Um, so to maintain this reduction, she's gonna wear a custom-made thigh-high stocking during the day. Um, we absolutely knew that she was going to need nighttime compression. Previous compression had failed. Um, she, it was a fairly significant lymphedema. Her foot is very involved and we find that those people generally have a lot of trouble maintaining. Um, so she has actually gone ahead and gotten and purchased a nighttime garment. So when her stockings come in, she'll be able to wear them home and use that bandaging alternative at night. Um, she needs to maintain a weight, healthy weight. She's a very slight lady, but again, she's 58 years old. So just knowing that if she gained weight, it might make it more difficult to maintain the reduction of her edema. Uh, activity, again, she's working lots, but just those specific exercises we teach that are really designed to take advantage of the muscle pump and, and make sure that the circulatory system's getting all the help it can get. Um, she has a lot of deep crevices in her foot. I think like they're almost an inch deep. 
And so she has to really take care of that to prevent any kind of risk of infection. Um, and I, we will definitely recommend to her, if she can, to go and have some um, massage on a regular basis. Again, she has a lot of fibrotic tissue in her foot, and it would just be helpful for her, I think, if she could go somewhere regularly and just kind of have that done. It's probably going to help her maintain quite a bit. Um, so there's just a difference. You can just see the difference in her left leg. Oh, sorry. That's okay. I'm done. <laughs> Um, so this is Jane. This was a, a really exciting case that we treated. So these are her front and um, um, back pictures. Um, she actually came, she's uh, only 25 years old. She treated, she again was from out of town, kind of a smaller town, a little bit isolated. Um, so she reported swelling for about five years, might be a little bit longer than that but she believes it started after an ankle sprain. So again, we try and get all the history that we can and we kind of make our guesses as to why this is happening, but we do kind of think with Jane that it probably was a congenital lymphedema. Um, so for her, she wasn't born with it. There's two types. One year you is shown up at birth and the other can show up anywhere from 12 years old to 40 years old, 50 years old. And we hear this a lot. My edema started after I had an ankle sprain or a fracture or a surgery and then it just didn't go away, it didn't go away and then it just slowly got worse. And so we kind of think that maybe that person was actually born with um, less lymphatic vessels or less nodes and their system was compromised to begin with and then with this fracture or this injury caused that system to kind of overload and then not function as well anymore. So it just doesn't take up that fluid anymore. So again, we just guess. We don't know for sure, but it doesn't matter. Again, it doesn't really um, affect how we treat this person. So her, her mobility was limited. She was able to walk. She walked into our clinic with a cane. Again, she's 25 years old, so it was a um, bit of a struggle for her. She never had any treatment for this. Um, so anybody from people were from where she were, was from were too scared to, to even touch her. So. Thank goodness she found us. Um, and she never, luckily, had any history of wounds or cellulitis. So her skin was actually fairly healthy compared to others that we see. So this is her post pictures. Um, we actually only treated her left leg. So somebody else treated her right leg. So we treated her left leg at the clinic. Um, we did 10 wraps, so again, we used a two-layer compression system twice a week. She had to find a, a ride to get into the city, so, um, and they just couldn't, couldn't afford it, they couldn't, couldn't manage anymore, so we reduced her, her left leg, which was her worst leg, and we had um, an OT and a nurse come from the town that she lived in, and we taught them how to wrap. So they maintained her left leg while her stocking came in, and then they decided that, yeah, we, we could probably handle this. So they treated the right leg and it got like that. So we don't have post, pre and post treatment uh, numbers for the, the right leg, but the, the pictures sh show it all, right? So, and again, we moved um, 8.6 liters of fluid just from that left lower leg. So she was fortunate enough that we were just able to compress her to the, the knee and we always measure above where we're compressing because we do not want that fluid going into the thigh and sitting in the thigh. Her thigh was very well maintained. Um, could be because she went from 307 pounds to 248 pounds. So <laughs> again, she just became a lot more active. She was eating healthier. She was feeling a lot better about herself. She came in looking at, to our clinic looking very depressed and sad and just you know, not not healthy 25-year-old woman. And, you know, she came for her follow-up with makeup on and nice clothes and just feeling amazing. It was amazing to see the difference in her. Um, so these are some uh, outcome measures that we do. So we do a tug, it's a timed up and go, it's a mobility assessment. And it reduced from 17 seconds to eight seconds. Um, her weight, again, reduced significantly. And her quality of life, where one is a low quality of life, 10 is high quality of life, increased significantly also. So we made some pretty 
amazing games with with Jane. We're pretty proud of that one too. And that is it. Oh right, so again, this is Jane in her custom knee-high stockings. Most of our people do go into a custom stocking. It's a flat knit stocking, very, very thick. Um, people usually look at it and get really scared, but um, it definitely is the most comfortable stocking for them to wear, and it's really the only thing that will maintain their edema. So um, she, we taught her how to bandage her legs at nighttime, so she's able to do that on her own, and she can get her stockings on and off on her own. It was a real struggle at first, but she was able to get it done, so I'm really happy with that. Um, she, again, has to maintain her weight. She has to stay active, has to watch her skin, and if possible, I don't think it will ever be possible for her because of her uh, income, but if she can get that manual of drainage um, done regularly, it would benefit her for sure. This is the part that's probably the most difficult part of this treatment. When we first started this clinic, we thought reduction would be the tough part, but it's not. It's, main it's maintaining them and teaching the clients how to maintain. It's finding the right stockings and the right garments. It is a very difficult um, thing to, to do. So, And these are her posts, pre and post pictures. So that's it. These are our, um, some information for us. We do our, again, with Alberta Health Services. It's our email address. This is our clinic number. We don't actually man this phone. You leave a message and we'll get back to you as soon as we can. <coughs> and then our, our fax number. We are on the Alberta Health Services website, finally. <laughs> so you can also find information about the clinic on the website. Does anybody have any questions? <laughs> for assessment right now they're looking at eight to ten weeks about eight to ten weeks for assessment so we try to get our assessments done as the clients come in it's really hard to say for treatment because we don't um, know what the clients are looking like right we just get them on a piece of paper we don't <laughs> know often have a lot of information to determine the how the treatment's going to look for them so we actually run a wait list for our assessments and we run a wait list for treatment. And often um, we can't even treat the clients because they're from out of town. So then we have to do some wayfinding for them. So this is why we like to get those assessments in. We try to do them regularly to, to weed those guys out and um, get in. Um, the only way we would consider that is by risk. And if the client is being um, actively treated with compression as an inpatient, we would probably take them. If they're already being treated, just to not waste that time that somebody's already put in, we would consider it. We'd have to know the details and, and things like that, but um, yeah. Yeah. For your last case, Jane, how often would you recommend uh, manual well, once a week, once every two weeks, it would, just, it would depend. It's really hard for us to say because I don't know of a lot of research that's done on MLD for this population and how, well, how successful it is. Um, but, I mean, it makes sense that it would be a good thing for her to do, right? To keep that lymphatic system stimulated and um, active. But she can't. And again, it's where she lives. It's definitely not accessible for her, unfortunately. Would you take referrals from um, other healthcare professionals, or does it have to be from a physician? Um, I think I would, as long as the physician is aware of the referral. Mm -hmm. We have to have a doctor's. We have to have a doctor's prescription when we get the stockings. So we need that relationship with the doctor. So we get lots of calls from healthcare professionals, and I suspect they often give the referral to the doctor with all the information on it. <laughs> which but, is fine. Which is fine, right? We don't mind that. It's just we, without that relationship, many of our clients need um, clearance for this treatment because of the risks. Um, and then we have to have a prescription from them in order to put the stockings through AADL. <laughs> Um, do you teach self-massage to some of your clients, or is that part of the repertoire 
regarding the self management at all? Um, we haven't done a lot of that, no. Some, maybe we have a little bit kind of um, to stimulate the, the nodes in the groin. Um. <coughs> Sorry. Sorry to interrupt. <laughs> We, we have found that it's very difficult to teach them how to do self-massage effectively. Um, we did put together and have just kind of been playing around a little bit with, um, we always teach them the deep breathing to try and stimulate. We teach them the lower extremity exercises and we have taught a couple of our people some, you know, just some, head, some things they can do to maybe stimulate upper body prior to, to us doing the compression. But from what we've learned, Self-massage is, it, it's very difficult for people to do it effectively. Mm -hmm. People over here are oh, waving. I know, I was trying to get these guys down. <laughs> she's waving a lot. Okay, go ahead. Hi. <laughs> That's why she's waving. Oh. <laughs> so, what, what are the nighttime garments like? Same as the, the are they the, the flat knit? Or are they, are they different? What are the nighttime garments? How are they um, We've been, I'm not supposed to use brand names. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. So we use um, Juxtafit by Circade a lot of. We find that it's a very easily to don, easy to don. And they have recently come out with um, ready-made sizing that actually fits. Like Jane would fit into something off the shelf, which is brings down the price significantly. And it's, it's a really great garment. So that's kind of one that we're tending to use. And I would love to experiment with other ones. But unfortunately, our clients have to buy it. There is no funding. I'm working on, I'm working on finding some time to, uh, to write a letter to ADL to try and get <coughs> funding. Because I do see a lot of other need besides lymphedema to use, use these bandaging alternatives for sure. Even in wound care, I think it would be an amazing choice. And many people bandage themselves if they're able to. Um, that's probably our most cost-effective way. It's just a lot of our clients aren't physically able to do that. But if they can, it's, it's something they can do for nighttime control. Mm -hmm. Is there a difference in the level of compression between nighttime and daytime? Um, pro well, usually we do recommend a little bit of a lower compression. So the, like the Juxtafit would probably does give a 30 to 40 millimeter mercury compression. <laughs> The difference in the compression though is that it's not elastic. It's not something that squeezes. It's a, the, the Juxtafit is a very low stretch neoprene garment, so it barely stretches. So when you put it on, there's two lines on the strap that tells you, kind of gauges that compression. Um, but really you're just supposed to put it on so that it's firm and comfortable and that they can tolerate it at night. So we, we don't really look at the numbers as much because it is a non-elastic type of compression. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was just wondering how does um, deep breathing work with lymphedema? Um, deep breathing uh, stimulates the large lymphatic duct in the in the torso. So with the diaphragm kind of moving up and down, it kind of massages the, the lymphatic duct, and that's the largest duct in the body. That's kind of where the legs um, drain to. So something that's very easy to do, people know how to do it, and it's definitely worth um, adding that into the treatment. Thank you. Mm. Yeah. Um, so how come you guys don't also treat the lymphedema cancer? Because it, it's just the cancer mm -hmm. seems to be caused by damage. Yeah, the yeah. So um, the need in the community was, because cancer-related lymphedema is treated at the Cross Cancer, and um, up until, well, they, were, they would take referrals for non-cancer-related, but it was just getting too much for them. So there was a huge, huge need for, for treatment for non-cancer-related lymphedema. So there is a service for cancer-related. There was not a service for, for non-cancer-related. That was funded by Alberta Health Services. Thank you, Darla and Heather, very much for, for the presentation. So, so thank, thank you very much. much. Um, 
So our next speaker is Dr. Rao, and Dr. Rao is an award-winning dermatologist who is board certified in both Canada and the United States. Immediately after completing his dermatology training in 2003, Dr. Rao became the first Canadian physician to graduate from the prestigious American Academy of Cosmetic Surgery Fellowship Program. For a full year, Dr. Rao was immersed in the art, science and research of cosmetic medicine and surgery, working alongside uh, some of the most famous names in the, in the field. Dr. Rao is, frequently, is a frequent resource for TV, radio, magazine, medium regarding various skin related issues. With his passion for dermatology, people and technology, Dr. Rao has distinguished himself as a renowned scientific and artistic dermatologist, skin and cosmetic surgeon, researcher, author and educator. And I hear you're a father too. <laughs> <laughs> he has authored over 50 scientific papers and textbook chapters and has been an invited speaker for over 200 lectures worldwide. Dr. Rao serves as an expert consultant to numerous physicians, business and industry and academia. Dr. Rao has won several awards including 2011 Canadian Dermatology Association Teacher of the Year Award and Avenue Magazine's Top 40 Under 40 uh, Award. Dr. Rao is a full clinical professor of medicine and currently serves as the program director for the dermatology residency program at the <coughs> University of Alberta, training future skin specialists in the science and art of dermatology. Uh, doc, every member of our, friend, uh, of our friendly and uh, professional team has been trained, uh, sorry I'll just leave that out. So Dr. Rao, thank you very much for, for coming tonight. So, can everybody hear me? Okay. Is, that okay? Is the volume okay? No. no. I don't want to deaf. Here, I'll, I'll just talk and I'll, I'll do this. Okay. Can everybody hear me in the back? Is that okay? Yeah, I'll try to speak a little bit loudly so we can maybe put that down if you like. So, um, thank you so much for, for that lovely introduction. Jeez, I wish my mother was here. <laughs> thank you. Um, so, uh, just a quick poll, poll from the audience before we, we get started. How many are healthcare workers in the audience? Quick show of hands, okay. And how many are not? Okay. So, I've kind of catered it uh, a little bit to both. And if I'm going a little, uh, perhaps uh, maybe too much in depth, just let me know and we can scale it back a little bit. Uh, how many have skin? <laughs> All right, good. Everybody's listening. My name is Jaggy Rao. I'm a dermatologist and I'm uh, practicing at the University of Alberta. I also serve as the uh, residency program director there and I do, I wear a lot of different hats. Um, I'm also a cosmetic dermatologist, but I also see a lot of wound care and lymphedema because I see maybe about 80% of what I do is, is purely medical. And um, I really enjoy seeing patients who, who have a lot of um, skin care problems because there's so much we can do now that we never were able to do before in the past. Uh, both our, our knowledge as well as our technology and techniques have improved pretty considerably. And I'd like to go through some of the, um, the manifestations of lymphedema for you. I don't think you've uh, gone through those talks in the last couple of weeks, right? Gone through pathophysiology, I understand, and um, venous insufficiency. But uh, now we're going to go through some of the skin manifestations of this, this condition. So a uh, very special thanks to uh, Mr. Ian Souls, who's going to be following me. Um, Ian is the, um, he's a therapist, not therapist, therapist and president <laughs> of Sally Terra Center. He's actually one floor uh, just, just below me in College Plaza, and he's a very nice fellow and very knowledgeable, and he's uh, helped my patients out quite a bit. So just wanted to plug uh, Ian, he's a fantastic person. And he's the one who invited me initially to come today and it was a pleasure to do so. Uh, Jessica is not here. Jessica Clark is our uh, account representative for 3M and she also, I believe, helped to sponsor this event. So uh, I think she's in Grand Prairie trying to fly back, but wanted to thank her as well. Okay, so uh, let's talk a little bit about lymphedema and, and some of its uh, sequelae. We know that it's very, very difficult and you know the good news is that there's a multidisciplinary team. We're basically here to help you and tell you what to do and, and what not to do. <laughs> so that's as our opening funny slide. <laughs> do this and don't do this. Okay. So um, let's talk a little bit about lymphedema. What is lymphedema? 
I've, uh, the general definition is it's considered to be an abnormal collection of protein-rich fluid within the interstitium of the skin. So that, uh, that means that normally that fluid should be within blood vessels. In this case, it's not in blood vessels, it's outside of blood vessels within the soft tissue. And that can result in uh, obstruction of a number of different things. There's venous obstruction, of course, but mostly what we're talking about today is going to be lymphatic drainage obstruction. And when you have that happening, then there's going to be a lot of backflow of fluid. More fluid will come out. Other elements will come out of the, uh, the lymphatics. And pretty soon, um, you're going to get skin sequelae. That's what we're going to discuss. So lymphatic obstruction causes an increase in the protein content of the skin. So normally, protein content should be low. In this case, when you have an obstruction, it has nowhere to go. It doesn't flow. It comes uh, through the, the lymphatic vessels into the, uh, the skin itself and then the protein contents will rise. When you have increased protein, guess what? You're also going to have a lot of water that's being associated with that because we know that water tends to um, migrate towards protein so the soft tissue starts to swell. I'm not going to go through this too much to bore you but it's just a bit of a review because it will pertain to what you see in the next few minutes. And then, of course, um, the increase in the extravascular protein will stimulate fibroblasts. So fibroblasts are the cells in the dermis, and when they get stimulated, they start to do some pretty crazy things. One of the things that they do is they'll self-replicate. So instead of having a few fibroblasts, you have a lot of fibroblasts there. Your skin becomes literally thicker, and when that happens, then usually it's good to have a little bit of uh, collagen and fibroblasts, but too much collagen and fibroblasts can actually stop things from happening. For example, they can push against uh, other vessels. And when you push against vessels, then of course you can have uh, venous insufficiency. And then uh, they can also um, push against nerves that can cause pain. Uh, if they push too much, sometimes you can even have an insensation. So it can actually stop pain from happening. And that's not good because as we know, uh, pain helps us to, to prevent damage and injury and trauma. And if you don't have that sensation, your skin can uh, be a, a sitting duck for a lot of bad things to occur. <coughs> So there's that, and then uh, oh, fluid that tends to build up that can in and of itself cause problems. We see that initially as pitting edema. So it's a uh, swelling that if you press down on it, you get a little bit of a pit, and eventually it becomes non-pitting edema, and you have a lot of other skin problems as well with it. So uh, on the left, what we, we have here is uh, normal lymphatic tissue. So we know that, you notice here, there's a lot of valves. So large vessels tend to have valves, be the veins or, or be them, um, uh, lymphatics like this and normally there's a, a superficial system and there's a deep system very similar to ve venous drainage and you have flow going back and forth like this uh, of course uh, keeping in mind where the valves are so generally speaking it's going to be towards the heart right? that's the way that uh, the drainage will be and it's not really the heart it's going towards lymph nodes the other thing that's very important to note not only is it fluid that's going through these vessels there's lymphocytes the so lymphocytes are white blood cells, are part of the immune system. And when you don't have proper flow of immune cells to and from the lymph nodes, then a lot of other problems can arise. The skin, as you probably know, is the largest organ, and it's also the largest immune organ. It helps to fight off infections. In fact, it's one of our first lines of defense. When that becomes compromised because of conditions like lymphedema, then a lot of bad things can arise, and we're going to go through that one by one. Here on um, the right side, we do see a problem. We see that there's an obstruction somewhere higher up. Here are the superficial as well as the deep system is involved. And when that happens, then no longer can lymphatic fluid flow because you have an obstruction there. So what happens, it comes back, the pressure pushes against the walls, and instead of those valves touching each other, those leaflets, now they don't touch each other, and then you basically have an incompetent valve or or an incompetent perforator, now no longer is there going to be unidirectional flow, there's going to be bidirectional flow. So it's flow going in both ways, and that continues, that process is a positive feedback cycle, and it essentially puts lots more pressure on the walls, and pretty soon, unlike a, a tube or unlike a, a pipe in the ceiling, the, the vessels here are made of cells, and when the cells stretch, what do you think is going to happen? you're going to have fluid and other material that leaves the cell, right? And what's more important than the fluid is actually the protein. So when protein leaves, then you're definitely going to have fluid that follows there. So that's what happens. We have reversal of flow, you have pressure against the walls, and then you have escape from a number of different elements, including fluid and protein. And this is what you're left with. So some of the signs and symptoms of lymphedema include, we've gone through this but just as a review, uh, chronic swelling of the extremity that's involved. 
Uh, primarily it's lower extremity and that's because of the effect of gravity as well. So gravity can be a nasty thing. When you already have an incompetent perforator or you have an obstruction, you have gravity compounding that, then you run into a major problem. That's why typically you'll see this on the legs and uh, about 80% of the time. But it can also involve upper extremities, the face, genitalia, the trunk, including uh, breast tissue. Along with that, we mentioned that there's a lot of lymphocytes. So those lymphocytes, remember, they serve a purpose. What's their purpose? They fight infection, they fight cancers, they fight a lot of things, but infection primarily and most acutely. If you don't have enough lymphocytes in the vessels where they should be to fight off infections, such as sepsis, etc., it's all in the tissue, then guess what? You're a sitting duck for infections. So that means if you are exposed to bacteria and it goes into your blood, no longer can you fight it as effectively as you normally would. And so um, as a result, we sometimes see people with fevers, chills, generalized weakness, and malaise. That will happen with, uh, with lymphedema over time. So it, not only uh, is it a physical issue, it also becomes uh, very much an immunological issue and can um, actually put them at risk for, um, for uh, infection. Fatigue, of course, because of the size and weight of the extremity. And then there's this whole psychosocial component to it, which uh, we don't have to even state because it's obvious. A lot of embarrassment uh, associated with that and impairment of, of daily activities and function. And we, we, just going back to the infections, not only do we see recurrent bacterial infections, we'll see recurrent viral infections sometimes and recurrent fungal infections. So normally there's fungi that we're always exposed to. In fact, I believe it or not, there's fungi living on our skin. Truly, we, we typically are, are able to fight that, but when, you are, when your uh, whole immune system is compromised and you have a lot of lymphedema, your ability to fight off these infections reduces and we start to see fungal infections. Even something as simple as dandruff is a form of fungal infection. Intertrigo, which we'll show you, which is um, a fungal or yeast colonization between the folds of the skin, all of these things tend to occur in lymphedema and not necessarily at the site. They can happen off the site in any folds as well. And, um, then we, we start to have different changes to the skin, which we're going to talk about here today. So uh, without going into too much detail here, um, we know that lymphedema management um, is there. Unfortunately, uh, it's multidisciplinary, so we have a lot of different experts that would be able to help you. Um, or, or your patients. So the goal of lymphedema therapy is to control the swelling, we want to restore function, we want to reduce physical and psychological suffering, we want to really prevent and develop um, a, a method to prevent infection. That's also extremely important. If it's uh, secondary lymphedema, for example, secondary to some other physical obstruction, searching out what is that, um, that secondary cause is very important because often it's removable or it's treatable or reversible. And that's what we should try to do, try to figure out what that obstruction is. And as I mentioned, it's uh, multidisciplinary. These are just some examples of the treatments that we can offer. Okay, today um, with that background, I've been asked to talk about some of the sequelae or, or some of the uh, manifestations of lymphedema. And by and large, I think uh, Ian, you wanted me to talk about cellulitis. So let's talk about cellulitis first and then we'll go through some of the other ones as well. So um, cellulitis. This, uh, this nice lady has cellulitis. You can see this redness, maybe a little bit of swelling on her leg, and it's extremely common in patients who have lymphedema. So what is cellulitis? It's uh, considered to be a spreading bacterial infection of the skin and tissues beneath the skin. So it's not just the surface of the skin, it's really deeper in the skin. And what are the organisms that are involved? They're typically the bacteria uh, Staphylococcus aureus, and streptococcus. And there's a number of different subspecies there. Typically, it's what we call strep pyogenes, also known as group A strep. So group A strep and, and staph, um, staph aureus are usually the types of, um, of bacteria that cause this, they're responsible for this. And uh, however, there's other different types of bacteria and there's even yeast cellulitis and fungal cellulitis that can occur, but um, that's a little bit beyond this, the uh, scope of this talk. This is, uh, we're gonna talk about more mostly bacteria. Sometimes uh, I mentioned here that cellulitis appears in areas where the skin has broken open. So uh, when you have skin that's inflamed like this and you have a reduction in the immune system uh, because of the, the uh, collection of lymphocytes there, then no longer will you be able to fight off the bacteria. We're, we're constantly being exposed to bacteria all the time, these bacteria in particular, and usually it's a battle between the bacteria and our immune system. In this case, you just don't have an active immune system locally. So the bacteria tends to proliferate, 
meaning it tends to um, replicate very, very quickly. So in a matter of one hour, you can have as, as much as 10 to the power of six bacteria from two bacteria just at the beginning. So it, it, um, it multiplies exponentially. So uh, the good thing to note is that pure cellulitis, true cellulitis, is not contagious. The reason for that is that it's very deep in the skin. It's not on the surface like, like you would expect it to be. It's actually quite deep in the skin. That's where the bacteria proliferates. So if you just go ahead and touch a person who has cellulitis, you're not going to pick up cellulitis. You have to have active bacteria on the surface and you have to have an altered immune system that's compromised and perhaps even a break in your skin, which is a portal of entry. Without those factors, you're not going to um, catch the same condition. So um, often, how do we treat it? We treat it because it's deep with oral antibiotics or intravenous antibiotics. Those are the treatments of, of choice. So here's my favorite organ. This is the skin. And this is normal skin. So at the top we see the epidermis, and then uh, that's all this, this um, tissue, and you see the surface. The epidermis stops about here. Typically the epidermis is only 100 microns thick. That's 0.1 of a millimeter. It's not very thick at all. It's pretty thin. And just beneath that, the bulk of the skin is this pink tissue that's very busy and has all these structures in it. That's called the dermis. So the dermis is here, and the dermis can be quite thick uh, normally, even up to four, four millimeters, maybe even a little bit larger in some areas, but uh, on average about four to five millimeters, and the epidermis is very thin. Beneath the dermis, we have this yellow pad of tissue, which is subcutaneous fatty tissue. And this doesn't have to do with your weight or anything like that. Everybody has some degree of subcutaneous fat, you have to. Now let's, um, let's focus on the dermis a little bit. So the dermis contains uh, a lot of different structures. You can see here it's quite busy. It contains blood vessels, both arterioles that supply oxygen and nutrients to the skin. Also uh, has venules and veins that bring blood back to the heart. And it has lymphatics that bring in and transport the, uh, the lymphocytes, those immune cells to and from the skin, plus uh, some fluid. You can see here there's a hair follicle, the hair follicle base, the bulb, goes right down to the deep part of the dermis, even extending into the fatty tissue. And associated with that, we see this odd looking structure. That's a sebaceous gland or oil gland. So almost all hair follicles are associated with um, these little glands. And then deep inside here, I think this is a, that looks like an acrosyringium. This is a, um, a sweat gland. And there's a number of different sweat glands that are there that release um, fluid and heat to the surface of the skin. And there's a number of other different um, different cell types as well. The pink part in the background is what we call extracellular matrix, matrix and collagen. So collagen is a protein that supplies the skin with its structural integrity and that's what uh, the fibroblasts create. So fibroblasts are cells within the, the dermis that produce collagen. That's their sole function and uh, it's very important for structural integrity. Uh, going back, we had mentioned that if you have a lot of protein in your skin, you're going to have lots of fluid there, but the protein will also stimulate the fibroblast to create more dermis. When you have more collagen deposition, collagen becomes thick, but it's not good collagen. In fact, it's not organized very well and it's not super functional, and its, very, it's structural integrity is very weak. It's, open, it's prone to cracking, it's prone to fissuring, and it also can push against a lot of the other structures, rendering them not very useful. That's why patients often who have a lot of very thick skin, they don't have very good oil production because it squeezes these sebaceous glands, just renders them pretty much useless at a certain point. Also, they won't sweat as well. So people who have very thick skin, they just don't um, sweat because this little sweat gland called the acrosyringium gets compressed by all that collagen and no longer can it release sweat, um, sweat fluid and of course the blood vessels as well. Now going back to cellulitis, cellulitis actually occurs here. This is the level of cellulitis deep in the skin, right deep here in the, in the dermis and perhaps even deep in the hair follicles. In fact it's believed to uh, the bacteria enters either by a break in the skin or through a hair follicle itself and that's how it gets access to the deeper tissue. Now why doesn't it stay in the surface? Well often in the surface um, we, we treat the surface. If it goes deeper, it's very smart. It has the ability to evade a lot of the immune system and to evade us from, from uh, trying our, our attempts to destroy it. So it tends to reside here, maybe even a little bit deeper into the subcutaneous fatty tissue. Now this is what it looks like. So signs and symptoms, what are the symptoms and signs? 
Well, typically, um, cellulitis will begin as a small area of tenderness. You'll get some swelling, some redness, and then it tends to very quickly spread to the adjacent skin. So as this red area begins to enlarge, uh, the affected person can develop a lot of host immune responses. For example, fever is often um, seen pretty early. Sometimes you'll get chills and sweats, tenderness. The lymph nodes may enlarge because of uh, activation of the lymphatics, and we, we call that swollen glands. You can often see this uh, redness will be well demarcated. See, so here's normal skin and here's where the cellulitis is. And often it's a good idea to probably track it or mark it and then watch it stage. So if it's growing very rapidly, then the patient could be at risk for, um, for sepsis or even deeper infection. So just going back here without boring you too much, um, cellulitis occurs when you have a bacterial infection right in this zone. If it's higher, do you know what you call that when it's in this zone? Right within the lower epidermis? Yeah, it's called erysipelas, E-R-Y-S-I-P-E-L-A-S. So erysipelas looks very different from cellulitis. Cellulitis is typically flat, well demarcated in red. Erysipelas is also well demarcated in red, but you have often an elevation in the skin. So there's so often uh, fluid and, and swelling that's there. So the skin will take on a bit of a bumpy appearance in addition to, to that. And often uh, erysipelas is not painful. The reason is the nerves tend to be quite deep. Cellulitis can be painful, but erysipelas is usually not painful. There is another form of infection that's a little bit higher. So this is cellulitis, and this we mentioned is erysipelas in this zone. What if it's right near the surface? Yeah, so I heard somebody I think say it. It's called impetigo. Right. So impetigo is the same organism, same type of infection, but very superficial, and that's characterized by honey-colored crusts. So a yellow crust, a little bit of breakage of the skin, you might get some fluid on the surface, perhaps a pustule here and there, but honey-colored crust is what you see. And often you'll see that in patients who have already compromised skin barrier function, eczema, psoriasis, and so forth, and typically impetigo doesn't hurt. It just looks very bad on the surface, but it's not um, very serious at all. So we got impetigo, we got um, erysipelas, we got cellulitis, and then we get, uh, there's a little barrier here. The skin does have a natural uh, barrier. It's called a fascia of the muscle. And if the infection goes into that fascia, that's very, very bad news. Does anybody know what we call that infection? Fasciitis. Yeah, that's necrotizing fasciitis. So if you have fasciitis or inflammation of that fascia, then yes, we, we we don't, we don't call it that because it would scare patients, but indeed, um, then there's no real, there's no way to stop the infection from, from going to other places. It's like a super highway. Once it reaches there, it can reach almost any area of the skin very, very quickly. So that's one of the reasons why we like to mark out where is the cellulitis, um, the front of it. Think of it almost like a wave, and if it's going really quickly, then we would probably change our treatment from oral to something that's IV, it just works a lot better. Okay, uh, where does cellulitis occur? So truly it can occur, occur uh, almost anywhere in the body, but the lower leg is the most common site of infection, particularly the area of the tibia, so the, um, the shin, uh, the bone of the foot, and you can see here some illustrations of that, so this is the tibia and shin bone. We often will see it in that area. And so that area, even if you didn't have lymphedema, is a site of, um, of where cellulitis is, is prone to happen. So imagine now if you did have lymphedema the uh, chances of that happening become very, very high. Um, sometimes you have it uh, on the arm, so we mentioned here. So these extremities are also prone to trauma, prone to microscopic injury where you have a portal of entry of the bacteria. In special circumstances such as surgery, you, you can have uh, what we call traumatic wounds. Um, cellulitis can also appear on the abdomen and chest areas. Um, people who have morbid obesity also tend to develop cellulitis in their abdominal skin often because of chafing. So they have a pa abdominal panis, and if that rubs against your, um, the, the lower skin, it can often cause friction and portals of entry and bacteria as well. So um, what other face, periorbital dermatitis, and uh, so an eczema that occurs around the eyes, and people rubbing their eyes, they can transfer bacteria there, start to get a periorbital cellulitis. Uh, on the cheeks, facial cellulitis, all of this is very common. So this is what cellulitis looks like. Um, here we have a redness, you got a warmth, you have a tenderness. The warmth is caused because of increased blood flow. So in our, as part of the host response, the veins become a little bit enlarged. 
bring more blood to the area, the capillaries, excuse me. Also, um, you'll have more redness because of that fact too, greater blood flow. There's often tenderness from the mild swelling that's deeper uh, in the tissue, and that pushes against nerve fibers. Uh, pain, so there's a difference between tenderness and pain, right? So tenderness is at the touch, painful to the touch, and pain is just uh, spontaneous. Uh, any skin wound or ulcer that exhibits any of these signs may be developing cellulitis, should be uh, assessed. And uh, there's a lot of um, different things that can mimic cellulitis, but we're not going to go through that today. So for example, eczemas can, uh, can <coughs> say, um, look like cellulitis. Other forms of inflammation can look like cellulitis. We do have a number of cellulitis clinics um, here, here in the city. The Royal Alex Hospital has a very good one. The University Hospital has a good one. And when they try to treat patients with antibiotics and it doesn't work, then they give me a call and I, I'll take a look at that and it may not be cellulitis. But they do have to treat it because it's better to err on the side of caution. If it's not cellulitis, uh, and I'm not sure what it is, but I've rounded it down to two or three things, we might take a little sample, send it off to the lab, a biopsy. So uh, what are the risk factors for cellulitis? Well, uh, most commonly cellulitis appears in an area where there's skin breakage, so I have an example of that. Here uh, you can see at the posterior heel, the Achilles tendon region, just because of uh, shoe wear. It seems like a benign thing, but this could be a portal of entry, and if a patient does have lymphedema, well then uh, their immune system locally has been impaired and that could be a serious issue. Even uh, small things like um, a small puncture wound or a cut can uh, cause that. Also uh, patients who have had an insect bite or arthropod bite reaction, spider bite, etc., they can uh, develop cellulitis in and around it. So anywhere where there's an ulceration or microscopic crack in the skin. Uh, in other circumstances, cellulitis uh, also occurs where there's no break at all. So, uh, and this happens where there's chronic leg swelling or edema. And we see that, of course, with lymphedema. So just by having lymphedema alone, it's a huge risk factor for this. Uh, other risk factors include diabetes. So if you have glucose intolerance or diabetes, the sugar levels in your, in your system, especially your skin, a little bit higher than what they should be microscopically, and that serves as a nutritional, nutrient-rich environment for the bacteria. Bacteria loves it. So it's a very good place for it to, to multiply. Uh, for people who, have, who are immunosuppressed, so HIV, AIDS individuals, uh, we can see the uh, cellulitis a little bit more commonly. Chemotherapeutic drugs that normally do bring down um, cancers also have the ability to suppress the immune system and that, uh, that can also can, uh, can serve as a nesting ground for cellulitis. Uh, also problems that involve reduction in the circulation of blood. So we talked a little bit about um, obstruction but also venous insufficiency. If your blood flow return back to the heart is compromised and you have a lot of blood that's pooling in the lower legs, you're a sitting duck for cellulitis. Um, what else? Obesity, pregnancy. When you're pregnant, your immune system is down a little bit because, it, uh, of course, the system doesn't want you to uh, fight the growing fetus, and that can cause um, you to be a, a little bit more prone to this. Surgeries as well, any type of artificial or um, man-made cut. Okay, uh, not to go too much into the uh, bacteria, this is, um, this is staph and strep. So this is the strep bacteria we talked about, um, uh, group, group A strep, or beta hemolytic strep can cause that. This is a staph uh, epidermidis bacteria. It's really the staph aureus bacteria, which is very similar to that. It's just chains of, of these, um, these cells, and they, they're really the, um, the major cause of not just cellulitis, but erysipelas, impetigo, and necrotizing fasciitis. Now the problem is with uh, use of antibiotics over time, we're now developing, this, these bacteria are developing resistance. So you might have heard of MRSA, methicillin resistant staph aureus, and you've heard, probably heard of VRE, vancomycin resistant endococcus. This will increase as time goes by. So it's very important if we can avoid antibiotics or prevent this from happening, that should be the way that we, we ultimately should go because we're losing our antibiotics over time. So um, how is cellulitis diagnosed and, and what's the treatment? Well, first it's, it's crucial for us to dig, distinguish is there truly an infection or is it an inflammation? And sometimes it's very difficult to do that. Um, truly, we don't want to biopsy the skin unless we really need to. Uh, if you do need to biopsy the skin, I'd highly recommend that a dermatologist perform it if you're considering cellulitis. We would do it in a sterile condition and make sure that um, it's done the right way. 
Even uh, infectious disease doctors won't um, typically biopsy because they're concerned that the biopsy itself might uh, create a portal of entry for bacteria. So, but, but that's really the, the best way to diagnose it. Um, failing that, if you didn't want to biopsy, it's just clinical experience. So seeing a lot of it, and that's what our job is, is because we, we see a lot of patients and we just have a lot of um, experience with different types of skin problems. But if you're not sure, it's still best to um, treat it with antibiotics. Um, the worst you do, of course, you're promoting resistance, but uh, it, um, it's better than the alternative. So we, we often will culture. Um, the problem with cellulitis is there's really nothing to culture. There's no fluid that's being produced at the surface anyway. There's no crust. There's nothing to swab. It's just purely flat skin, and it's often difficult to, to uh, even get a sample. So th that's the thing. If you are uh, unable to culture, send it to us, and we we'll probably biopsy it if we needed to. Okay, so that's one. And then we have to, uh, once we determine that this is um, not inflammation, it's true infection, and one of the best ways to do that is history. Both the long-term uh, past history, but also going forward, we try to mark out the, um, the border for, this, for the cellulitic plaque. And if we notice that it's rapidly advancing, there's very few inflammatory conditions that can do that. It's probably infection. If it's unilateral, that is one-sided versus the other side, then it's probably a, a, an outside source that's caused it, probably an infection. Okay, so uh, treatment, how can we treat it? Well, we talked about antibiotics. Uh, still, the, the best treatment is still uh, penicillin for staph and strep. So we're talking either oral penicillin or even IV penicillin. The problem is resistance, and the also problem is a lot of people are allergic to that. Not a lot, but we would say maybe about 10% of people, which is, in numbers-wise, it's, it's enough that we have to ask them, are you allergic to penicillin? If they are, there are other substitutes to penicillin, like clindamycin. Bactrim, which is a sulfa drug, which a lot of people are allergic to that as well. Clindamycin, you have to be careful because high doses and long durations can cause problems like uh, pseudomembranous colitis, which is uh, another bacteria that can grow out of proportion in the gut. So we have to also always be careful with the side effects of the medications that we're using. We have, um, if you did have methicillin resistant Staph aureus or BRE, vancomycin resistant enterococcus, there are uh, heavier duty, duty drugs that we can use like imipenem and uh, so forth, which we, we hate to use those because they have some pretty nasty side effects. Okay, so cellulitis prevention how it, it re still remains the key. We really should try to prevent this, and um, under some circumstances it can be prevented by proper hygiene. I think we kind of talked a little bit about that. Uh, treating chronic swelling of tissue, so edema by compression, very, very crucial. Uh, care of wounds and cuts, trying to make sure that that does, doesn't occur in the first place. Uh, in other cases, microscopic breaks may not even be apparent uh, and infection can develop, so really um, we, we try to moisturize the skin. If you can moisturize the skin with a good moisturizer, it doesn't just moisturize the skin, it acts like a sealant, so that would be a barrier protectant, so it, it does repel or retard the entry of organisms, and especially for people who have a weakened immune system, it's important to do. So just meticulous skin care and compression, I think, is the biggest thing that we can do so far. Now, uh, the other thing you can do for prevention is try to manage underlying conditions. So this is a patient who has lymphedema, and he's got all of these conditions. He's got hypertension, diabetes, impaired cardiac function, swelling of the legs, um, venous return issues, and all of those could be managed medically. We'll need a multidisciplinary team, perhaps a quarterback to do that. Typically, an internist would do that. Um, in conjunction with a family physician, perhaps. You need somebody like that to, to help out. And of course, from the skin point of view, um, dermatology would help. Okay, so what's the outlook? What's the prognosis for people with cellula uh, for cellulitis? It, it's uh, a treatable condition. It's very important to remember that uh, antibiotic treatment is necessary to eradicate the infection, but we really need to prevent it from occurring. Talked about some of those uh, prevention methods. Most cellulitis can be treated effectively with oral antibiotics at home, but at the point it fails, it's very important to quickly recognize that and put a patient onto IV antibiotics. Sometimes hospitalization is required to do that um, if the oral antibiotics aren't, in, aren't effective. If it's not properly treated, unfortunately cellulitis can spread both laterally, but also it can go deeper. We talked about the possible risk of necrotizing fasciitis. That's pretty rare, but uh, more commonly is that bacteria can go into the bloodstream. So we have bacteria that's now going through the lymphatics and the bloodstream, and if that happens, then a person can develop sepsis. 
and other organs can get involved, for example, the heart or the liver or kidneys. So it's important to uh, try to prevent that from happening. Any questions about that? Yes? What's your feelings about compression and cellulitis that's being treated appropriately with antibiotics? It's good. If, yeah. you, do you believe that that's the mainstay of therapy, absolutely. You want to prevent that from happening and you want to treat the uh, cause for the infection. During, sure. the, uh, during the cellulitic uh, episode. Yeah, you should, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The uh, International Indigenous Framework outlines um, prophylactic antibiotics for reoccurrent cellulitis in conjunction with combined ingestive therapy. Do you, do you see that happening much here, and, and is it a yeah. worthwhile thing to do? Yeah, so the question was, um, what about uh, prophylactic antibiotics for people who are at high risk, for example, with lymphedema? And yeah, it's, I think it's a good idea. I mean, unfortunately, we know in the back of our mind that we're uh, potentially promoting uh, resistance, but there's, it's the best way sometimes to do it. So practically speaking, it works extremely well. What I would suggest to uh, prevent um, the uh, uh, recurrence or to prevent uh, uh, any resistance is to maybe do it for a short period of time and rotate your antibiotics. So, or, or the other thing is to couple your antibiotic with another antibiotic so that you don't have resistance. Really, the, the body doesn't realize what it's on in a way, and so it, it, that's been shown to help. Good. Okay, let's move on. Um, these are other skin issues associated with lymphedema, and I thought I'd just, uh, in the time that we don't have a lot of time, but I can go through some of this. A lot of this will be just recognition. When you see this, at least now you can put a name to this, and we'll talk very briefly about how we can manage that. I tried to do something a little bit different with PowerPoint, so bear with me if it doesn't work. Um, we're gonna go through some of these that are underlined. So we have early lymphedema, which is characterized by non-tender pitting edema initially, and then eventually what happens is that edema is no longer pitting, it, it, it becomes uh, non-pitting. You have radial enlargement of the affected limbs, as we've seen, and you get this uh, condition called peau d'orange skin texture, and as the name implies, it looks like an orange skin. Now, let's see if this works, hopefully this works. Yeah, so there we go. This is uh, edematous skin, and literally what it's done is um, all that fluid that's in the, in the dermis has expanded the skin and as a result, the little pores and hair follicles appear a little bit more expanded, and it looks very similar to that of an or skin of an orange, right? So we call this peau d'orange, and that's something that you um, often will see lymphedema. Let's go back. Oh, good, it worked. So then, woody edema. So look at this. Guess why we called it woody edema? Yeah, looks like a tree, right? Looks like bark, and it's in many ways. You, not only do you have texture that's very bark-like, but you also have very dry skin. Extremely dry, right? So remember that you have um, a lot of fluid, plus you have fibroblasts that are pushing against the, um, the sweat glands, the equine sweat coils. So that reduces the amount of sweat that's being released and the skin dries out. Also the oil glands that normally would hydrate the skin and, and lubricate the skin, this is being reduced and as a result you, don't, you have a very dry, woody appearance. Also the color that you're seeing there, that brown discoloration, does anybody know what that is? Iron, yeah, I hear somebody say rust, right? So, in a way, that's right, yeah, so it's iron oxide, right? Also known as hemosidrin. So rust is on cars, but hemosidrin's on humans. But uh, same concept, when you bite into an apple, it turns brown, that's all iron, right, that's being oxidized. So yeah, there's a little bit of hemosidrin pigmentation that's there too. Okay, so let's go through uh, some of the chronic features that we see. Is that okay? Go like that, I'll just run, run through this and hopefully we'll get through in time. So um, this whole concept of having thick skin can, so can sometimes be quite overwhelming uh, to the point that their skin can look very, very thick. Which animal has the thickest skin? Elephant. elephant, yeah. So we have this elephantiasis nostra. Varicosa or elephantiasis, yeah. The other term um, we use is pachydermia. Pachyderm is an elephant, and in dermatology we like to use a lot of Greek and Latin, so it makes us sound smart when we're not. This is pachydermia, so not only do you have thick skin, you're starting to get these uh, little cobble stoning, we call it. So those are just fibroblasts that have collected there. They're little papillomas and um, takes on this elephant-like appearance. So this nodular fibrosis, 
uh, we sometimes see. So in, this is very different from the elephantiasis uh, that you've just seen. These are just localized bumps on the skin, and these are called nodular fibromas. They're nodules, and they contain lots of collagen in them. So lots of fibroblasts and collagen, very localized there, not typically painful. Um, and they're often associated with dilated uh, lymphatic vessels if you took a little biopsy. They can appear in different forms. So here we, we see mushroom-like um, uh, lesions. Sometimes they can appear like skin tags. Other times they can just be large circles, just spheres, little spheres. And treatment generally is pretty conservative. If you treat um, the overlying lymphedema as we've seen today, often these will go down by themselves, but sometimes not. And we just have to either excise them or use laser treatment to remove that as well. Yellow nail syndrome, has anybody ever seen this? So yellow nail syndrome, uh, typically for lymphedema, of course, it would appear on the feet, but uh, you can have it on the hands, and you can have it because of other causes as well. It's believed to be um, dilatation of the lymphatics at the distal extremities. So for whatever reason, there, there seems to be a collection of, of lymph um, fluid that's in the area, and that changes the optics of your nail. So if you look at your nail, the nail appears pink. Why? Because of several reasons. One is there's blood vessels that are there, but also the, um, the overlying nail plate is tightly adhered to the nail bed, and that gives it that uh, optical um, pink look. To it. But when you have fluid that's just underneath the nail bed or right underneath the, um, the nail, where the nail plate attaches to the nail bed, that can change the way the, um, the color is. And in this case, it looks yellow. <coughs> and so we call that yellow nail syndrome. Okay, oh, okay. papillomatosis. So this is something that you don't see all the time, but, um, but at, at times you can. It's, it's got a very fancy oh. name. It's called papillomatosis cutis lymphostatica. If we dissect that, papillomatosis means small little growths, almost like skin tag. Cutis means skin. And lymphostatica means that there's lymphatics that have become static. They just not, you don't have any mo uh, mobile lymph tissue or lymph fluid. So when that lymph remains static there, it stimulates the, um, the surrounding skin to actually produce more, fibro, uh, uh, more fibroblasts and more collagen. And if you have that in small areas like that, you can get papillomas or these little um, overgrowths. And if you took a biopsy of that, you'd see a lot of little lymphatics in there, perhaps some blood vessels. You'll see that uh, they can either be villus, which is straight up, or they can be fibrous, um, almost like a velvety fur-like appearance. And, um, Unfortunately, it doesn't look very good, and it can also house a lot of bacteria. So bacteria can house between those individual papillomas, and that uh, becomes another problem. It's positive feedback. And the yellow at the top? I'm sorry? The yellow at the top? This yellow at the top is um, what we call keratin. It's dead skin material. So because you have um, skin that, that's proliferating at a faster rate, it's producing faster than the, the um, surface can actually exfoliate, so it collects there, and then it oxidizes and becomes yellow or even black at times. Leg veins. So this is um, greater saphenous ve venous dilatation. Um, these are true varicose veins. So there's three, three types of veins one can have in the leg. One is spider veins, where the, the diameter is less than a millimeter and those really don't serve a problem. We, we treat them just cosmetically because people don't like that. Uh, if it's larger, if it's between three millimeters to six millimeters, we call those reticular veins, they're blue-green. They usually don't serve uh, much of a, a problem, but they can be quite painful because they're large and the blood flow that goes through there can press against uh, nerves. And then you've got these, which are varicose veins, and not only are these symptomatic typically, they're also pr potentially dangerous. Patients, a sitting duck for superficial uh, venous thrombosis, maybe even deep vein thrombosis. The um, chance of stasis becomes very, very high. Pain, tenderness, all of that. And we can often see this concomitantly with lymphedema. <coughs> oh, treatment, we can talk about that, but how do you treat it? Um, if you see a varicose vein like this, the only way to treat it would be surgical. Either you would take off a section of that or we would we'd send to one of our vascular surgical colleagues to remove a section of that so that blood can no longer flow. And then um, either the vein gets resorbed or we can strip the vein itself. So we either tie off the vein or we take off a section of the vein. And that's pretty, uh, pretty intense surgery. I don't know if you've seen these. These are called ski jump nails, toenails. So um, not really sure why this occurs. 
we do think that uh, it's probably pressure on the, the proximal nail fold from lymphatic fluid. So if you have um, lymphedema and a lot of collection of lymph fluid there, it compresses against the matrix cells that cause the nail to occur. So the nail is in fact just an extension of the skin and it's just a dead extension of skin. It's all dead skin tissue, what we call keratin, that's being produced by matrix cells that are just underneath the cuticle here, the proximal nail fold, deep inside. You can imagine if there's a lot of pressure there, then it will cause um, the nail to change. And there's different ways that it can change. In the case of lymphedema, uh, take a look if you have any lymphedema patients, they may have what's called ski jump or upward turning nails. There's a bit of a an arc here instead of going straight down, straight or down, it just goes upwards and that's called ski jump nails. Okay, and then uh, ulceration. I think, um, I think we already kind of discussed this probably in, in the first week, but um, chronic venous ulceration can occur, um, especially if there's stasis that's there and there's a compromised blood flow. Uh, also known as chronic venous insufficiency. If you take a look at this, typically you'll find it in the gator region of the foot. That's the medial malleolus or medial ankle. You'll have an ulcer that's there that's not very well demarcated, but surrounding it there will uh, often be some, some uh, accompanying <coughs> skin changes. So uh, we're talking about a ruddy discoloration. Sometimes uh, it'll appear wet and um, it, not necessarily painful, although you, you think it might be, often uh, it may not be actually. So principles of therapy, we want to make sure that there's no bacteria on the surface that's impairing the uh, wound healing. You want to increase venous return, of course, and you want to keep the base very, very nice and clean. And um, usually if you do that, over time it will heal any underlying factors, of course. I'm just going to jump to the next one here. This is called folliculitis. So we talked about um, inflammation of the hair follicles and cellulitis. Well, in this case, you can see it with lymphedema. Because the pores are dilated, and we talked about the peau de range appearance, thus the uh, pores that are, are larger act as a larger um, conduit for bacteria to enter. When the bacteria enters there, it um, is often met with some type of an immunological resistance. So your immune cells try to fight it, and you start to develop pustules redness, a little bit of tenderness, and that's what we call folliculite. It's almost like an acne appearance, but it happens on the body in the area of hair follicles. There's different types of folliculitis. Some are infectious, some are not. In the case uh, of lymphedema, almost always it will be an infectious type of folliculitis, either staph or strep. Okay. So moving on, okay, here we go. So fissures and cracks. So we talked about how the skin can be quite dry with lymphedema for um, reasons of, we mentioned compression, but also the extremity itself, even without lymphedema, can be very dry in this kind of weather. This particular year has been notoriously cold and dry. I've seen lots of people with uh, issues like this or, or worse. So uh, this is uh, actually a true break within the epidermis and dermis, and then often there will be a buildup of dead skin tissue in an attempt to repair that. So not only do you see the crack, but you'll see some uh, what we call hyperkeratosis, um, dead skin material around that. And it's, it, can, it can be a nuisance for sure. It can be quite painful depending on uh, patient's on, uh, neural status in that area. So how do we treat it? We uh, often will debride the area um, after exfoliating, often an exfoliating after a bath. So we tend to, to soak the skin. We use a lot of therapeutic moisturizing creams to, to try to hydrate the area. And then uh, sometimes um, if it's for the hyperkeratosis, we can remove that using uh, a, a very a bland um, debriding agent. Something like a loofah sponge would be okay. We do have chemical debriding agents as well that can do that, salicylic acid, lactic acid, et cetera. But it'd have to be catered to the patient. Let's take a look at hemosiderin staining. So um, this is what we're talking about, this brown discoloration. You'll see that quite often in chronic venous, uh, chronic venous insufficiency as well as lymphedema. And literally it's caused by red blood cells, which normally should be within a vessel, have extravasated. They've come out of the vessel into the tissue. And as we know, um, red blood cells in, a, in the vessel will last for about 90 days. Outside of the vessel, they last for about maybe 10 days to up to maybe three weeks. When they break down, Blood cells are, are made of hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is composed of iron, and the iron oxidizes with this uh, tissue oxygen, and it becomes brown. So somebody had mentioned rust, and yeah, that's an affectionate way. It's not technically rust, by the way. Rust is a different form of iron oxide. This is Fe2O3, slightly different. This one is more biological, and this one doesn't go away. 
The only way to make it go away, does anybody know? You have to treat it like a tattoo. So we use tattoo removal lasers to remove this. Often, um, you know, people don't want to do that, but if it's very widespread, that's the only way to remove this. Lightening creams won't work. Um, bleaching agents just don't work. You have to physically um, either cut it out, which we don't want to do in these cases, or use laser treatment. Just moving on here, we have um, hyperkeratosis. We kind of talked about this. This is a dry, flaky skin that builds up in multiple layers. And what's happening is the skin is overturning at a fast rate, in fact, faster than, um, than it can actually exfoliate. So normally skin will grow, come to the uh, surface, and then it will flake off as dead skin. In this case, um, it's just happening too quickly. It's just not flaking off. And as a result of that, you get this dry flakes. So daily hygiene, skin care, um, we talked about therapeutic based moisturizers, and lanolin is a good, good choice, so we will often mix that for patients as well. And then you can even try um, using a mild abrasive exfoliation nut, a product, loofah sponge, mesh bath sponges, have to be very gentle because we don't want to cause a lot of trauma. And we talked about stasis dermatitis. So this is different than hyperkeratosis because here, not only do you have the dry skin and you have some hyperkeratosis, but you also have this redness, you have this inf inflammation, you have mild swelling of the skin, and it almost looks like cellulitis, but it's not smooth, it's rough. And the big hallmark here is often it's itchy. So if it's itchy, often there's an inflammation that's there at, at the depth where um, you can say safely, this is probably an eczema or stasis dermatitis. Treatment of choice here, oh, also sometimes look for weeping. So early eczema is wet. In fact, the word eczema means, eczematous means a boiling over. So it tends to boil and you have a lot of uh, fluid and then it becomes very dry. That's what chronic eczema is like this one. So look for that and ask about that. Um, the way to treat it, you wanna hydrate the skin and then you wanna reduce inflammation. So often we'll use either topical corticosteroids or we can use um, alternatives to steroids. There's creams such as Elidel and Protopic, which are called calcineurin inhibitors. They work very similar to steroids, but they don't have the side effects of thinning the skin, etc. Ingrown toenails. So this is a common dermatologic problem for all people, but particularly if you have uh, lymphedema, you have chronic venous insufficiency, where uh, the nail plate um, basically will grow faster. And it grows faster, but it doesn't grow out. In fact, it just becomes thicker. So often patients will have thick nails, and that can cause the nail plate to ingrow into the, the soft tissue. And that, in and of itself, can cause inflammation. In fact, this, in this case, the inflammation has spread to surrounding tissue. So we call this a peronychia. Peronychia means inflammation of the soft tissue surrounding the nail plate. It's quite red, swollen, tender, painful. You're even starting to get a little tissue response here. This uh, is called a pyogenic granuloma. It's an overhealing of, um, of skin where you have blood vessels in that site. So how would we treat this? Yeah, we would do what's called a toenail avulsion. So, um, of course, it's very painful. Normally, we would anesthetize the entire toe by a ring block, and then we would just take out the, the toenail plate. It's pretty straightforward, a five-minute procedure. And then, of course, um, we want to make sure that the wound that's being created by that will heal very nicely because we don't want to create a, another uh, avenue of entry of bacteria. Uh, we talked a bit about this condition. This is called intertrigo. It's a rash that occurs in skin folds. So the, um, we, we often see this with lymphedema, but we also see it with other conditions as well. So people who have uh, skin rubbing against skin basically are prone to this. Even small children, babies are prone to this. We, this is, in fact, diaper rash is a form of intertrigo. It's basically a combination of skin rubbing against skin, bacteria, and yeast. So that's something that people don't usually consider. But yeast loves that kind of sweat-laden, moist environment, and um, often it'll make it flourish, right? So to treat this, what we need to do is stop skin-to-skin -skin contact. And we can do that by formulating a cream or barrier protection physically. Uh, we need to reduce the yeast population, and we need to also reduce the way that the body responds to the yeast. So the inflammation that you're seeing here can be reduced by a topical anti-inflammatory. Just a couple more here. This is interesting. This is called lymphorrhea. So if somebody has very acute lymphedema, 
So yeah. a secondary lymphedema, and it's happened all of a sudden, for example, filariasis. If that happens very acutely and somebody has gone from a leg that was uh, normal to one that uh, is, is pretty large, often you will see lymphorrhea. So lymphorrhea is a leaking of, a lar of large volumes of, of serous fluid from breaks in the skin, microscopic breaks in the skin. There's so much fluid and it's come right to the, the surface. And instead of being interstitial, it's now able to actually leak out. If you press their skin, you'll see that this will just leak out. And you don't see this with chronic lymphedema, you see it more with acute lymphedema. And um, yeah, treatment is pretty much the same. We, we give absorptive dressings. Um, sometimes we use topical antimicrobials to prevent infection, but compression therapy, most crucial. That's lymphorrhea. And this is pretty rare, but I just put it here. If you see somebody who's got chronic um, lymphedema and you've done the compression therapy and they still have this large bulge that just doesn't go down, it's probably a large cyst. So a cyst is a, um, basically a, a, a tissue or a lesion that has a wall in it. So this wall surrounding this lymphatic fluid has occurred because the, the skin is trying to protect itself. And the way to do that is to kind of wrap itself around this, this uh, entity, this lymph fluid. So you have adjacent connective tissue and it looks like a little translucent bubble. In fact, if you had a very powerful light and you shone it from one side, you could probably see it glowing on the other side because it's just fluid that's inside there. So if you see this, uh, one of the things we could do is we could drain it. Um, of course, you want to do that under sterile conditions and we take a, a large caliber uh, needle and we simply drain it. And it's actually a source of relief for patients. It doesn't hurt. In fact, it, um, it's, they feel better with it because when you drain all of that fluid, there's no longer pressure against the uh, surrounding nerves. And just a couple more here. Toe and foot abnormalities. So imagine having this uh, chronic pressure against uh, your bones as well as your, your, um, your cartilage eventually that's going to cause some deformity, especially if people are uh, weight-bearing. So what they'll do is they will compensate and they will change their gait in order to avoid pain, right? So when that happens, the, the foot truly can become deformed permanently. I mean, I didn't show you an x-ray, but if you take a look at x-rays of patients who, who have changed their gait, truly you see really, really interesting um, things like, like curved bones. You can see that uh, sometimes there's even uh, ulcers in bones that get resorption. Uh, because of that weight change, that gait uh, abnormalities, because of the offloading. And that's totally permanent? Yeah, in some cases it is permanent. Yeah. And then just one last thing here, hopefully you, you never see something like this, but um, if you see a lesion within an area of lymphedema and it looks red, that's something that you definitely want to send to a dermatologist. This here is uh, what we call an angiosarcoma. So angiosarcoma is a fatal skin cancer. It's basically a skin cancer of blood vessels and lymphatics that's occurred because of chronic lymphedema over time. So fortunately, we don't see a lot of that with leg lymphedema, but we see a lot of that post-radiation uh, therapy and chemotherapy for breast cancer. So when you remove lymph glands, especially the uh, axillary lymph nodes, then sometimes uh, you, you won't get, of course, you'll have a large arm. And uh, with that chronic lymphedema in that limb, or sometimes even the breast tissue that, where you've had a mastectomy, you might see this uh, forming. It's called a Stuart Treves angiosarcoma. And if you see something like this, the prognosis is very poor. Um, the, the death rate is about 50% in five years. So we want to, if we, we want, it still is an opportunity to treat it if it's early. The ones who do well are, are treated early. You def, definitely don't want to let this fester. And you definitely don't want to dismiss it as being something that's a benign entity when it's really not. So the way to diagnose it would be um, clinical, but also by biopsy. But this isn't the only malignancy that can occur. You can get squamous cell carcinomas, basal cell carcinomas, something called a Kaposi sarcoma. Even melanomas can occur not just because of the fluid that's there that promotes skin. Remember that the proteins will actually promote skin to arise and that's part of the problem with cancers, but also the immune system is compromised so it's just not fighting off any early skin cancers or pre-cancers. So if cancer is suspected, definitely you want to um, clear this with a physician, probably a specialist like a dermatologist. Okay, so that is it. So don't give up, you know, if you see something like this, there's a lot of things we can do. I just wanted you to be able to uh, recognize some of the, uh, the skin issues that, were, that we, we, we sometimes might see with lymphedema. This is truncal lymphedema. Are there any questions? Yes, ma'am.
Yeah, so cortisone shots do reduce your immune system even further, and, and I have had cases. Are you talking about like um, an intramuscular shot of cortisone? Yeah. Yeah, that is one of the side effects of uh, intramuscular injection is reduction of your immune system. You have to be very careful. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Are all these stages of lymphedema, like the pinnate edema, the radial enlargement, and the code orange, et cetera, are that all inevitable if you don't take care of yourself? Or does it only happen to some people? Um, the the podorange and the uh, pitting edema are, are pretty much uh, acute, so you will see that in, in all case, almost all cases of, um, of acute edema right away. But the chronic ones you may or may not see, depending on the pressures that are involved. But yeah, for podorange, you pretty much will see that all the time initially. Yes, sir. Um, do you recommend a certain brand of moisturizer to use? No, uh, no. In fact, the, the, to be frank, they're, they're all very comparable. The, the um, cosmeceutical industry will say no. They'll say that there is a superior, but um, frankly, they, they all, um, as long as they can, uh, they, and, and the other thing is they're a misnomer to call it a moisturizer. We call it that, but they don't actually provide a lot of moisture to the skin. They retain the moisture that's already there. So what I tell patients is if you're going to use a moisturizer, make sure you put it on ideally after the skin is wet or after you've soaked the skin for about 15 minutes. When you do that, then, then truly it's moisturizing because it, it locks it in. The only true moisturizer is water, right? So we want to make sure that the water stays in the skin. What they do offer is a barrier protectant. So if you have any microscopic breaks in the skin or large pores such as the peau d'orange, it'll act as a, um, a, a covering for that. It'll seal that to some degree. So think of moisturizers as sealants. It's the way to go. Now, some of them have uh, different elements like um, ceramides. You might have heard of those. Ceramides are proteins that are in our skin that, that retain water. Having it exogenously apparently doesn't work. So it's very different, the ceramides that our skin makes versus what's in a bottle. So it's just not biologically active, but the companies will let, lead you to believe that. There's a lot of um, moisturizers that have um, collagen and other proteins in it. Those things are it's just a, a fad. It's, it's, not, um, it's not functional. Yes, ma'am. You're trying to get rid of the fluid out of your body, but they keep telling you to drink all the water you can. Yeah. So it's very important to, to keep that water flowing. Yeah, so this is a good point. Um, a lot of people believe that if you drink water, your skin will become hydrated, and that's not true. It's a big, big, huge fallacy. It's absolutely untrue. There's no truth to it. You can drink as much water as you can, and you can still have tremendous eczema. Uh, as evidenced by almost everybody in Alberta, right? Um, you have to get the water from outside in with, uh, for, if you want to improve your, your uh, skin, skin structure and st skin quality. It has to come that way if you have eczema. The more water you drink, it's great for your system and your bloodstream and your gut, but for it to go into the skin is virtually impossible. Is it good though for the lymphedema when you've got lymphedema to, to drink that water and keep flowing that? I don't think so, because I think with lymphedema you have an obstruction, right? So in fact, you might even compound it theoretically, but I don't think it has any effect on it now. Good question. Any other questions? Oh, no. Okay, so uh, if, if you would like to um, see myself as a dermatologist, my, my office manager, Rhea, has left some cards here. Um, you would need a referral uh, if it's a, a medical issue, but I'd be very happy to see you. If you have any patients that you'd like to send uh, who, who may be um, warranting some dermatologic care, please don't hesitate to, to let me know. I'd be very happy to help you in any way. And thank you for your time. Alrighty, um, I'm just going to be talking about some things that, that in some respects, um, um, Heather's covered already. Um, but we're, we're, we take a bit of a different approach um, because we don't have the same kind of constraints with respect to tight protocols and restrictions and basically the amount of care you can get depends on your resources and uh, not the public sectors. So um, I'm going to walk through some things that, that uh, are similar to what you've heard, um, but maybe have a little bit of a different twist. Basically, a management plan for lymphedema depends on the site of the lymphedema, the stage of it, the complexity, how severe it is, those kinds of things. Um, and, and the presence and nature of comorbidities. You know, Heather and her group see a lot more um, comorbidities 
um, than we often do because uh, we tend to um, have lymphedemas that present um, at, a, at a much earlier stage. Um, as well, our management plans depend on whether or not people have previously had treatments and what their effects were and what their physical and, and physio psychological tolerances of treatment are. One of the things that we haven't talked much about in, in this series is um, going through combined decongestive therapy, whether it's manual lymph drainage in conjunction with compression therapy and exercise, or whether it's compression therapy alone, is not an easy process. Um, it's a process that um, we see a number of clients um, struggle with because you are in, in this compression and, and uh, it, it does affect your life during that, that process and uh, it's, it's not, I don't know if, how many people have actually been in compression but it's for any extended period of time it's, it's not something that is really that enjoyable. And as well, your social situation will depend upon uh, your tolerance of it and, and also what the goals of treatment are. The severity of the lymphedema and the underlying condition and people's circumstances have a lot to do with um, the treatment approach that we take and the, the length of the session, the number of treatments required. Um, so all of those things are factored into how to go about it. A treatment with um, respect to, to lymphedema can range anywhere from MLD sessions without compression for really um, mild edemas um, to intensive therapy protocols where we do daily uh, appointments from 75 to 90 minutes for a period of 10 to 14 days. So people are coming in every day um, getting manual lymph drainage, being wrapped, um, getting exercises, coming back again wrapped or maybe they've been out of the wrap for an hour and they're, and they're going to go through another series of MLD and then um, compression. Three phases of treatment. There's an intensive phase which is a reductive phase. Um, there's a transition phase where you're moving into um, being in full-time compression garments and then there's a maintenance phase after that. Um, four pillars of treatment that you're probably getting some good sense of. Um, manual lymphatic drainage, compression, exercise, skin care. Those are really the four pillars of combined decongestive therapy. And uh, all four of those are, are really important, as you can tell from Dr. Rao's presentation, um, the importance of skin care. Uh, we talked last week um, in depth about exercise and, and the value there. And uh, you've heard a lot about compression. There are contraindications of conditions um, with respect to um, manual lymphatic drainage and combined decongestive therapy, and there's reasons to withhold it in, in certain situations. Manual lymph drainage accelerates lymphatic flow, and uh, as a result, there are a number of, of health concerns um, that if you're experiencing the following situations, you need to discuss or not receive treatment. If you have untreated malignant diseases, if you have acute inflammations, recent thrombosis like deep vein thrombosis, cardiac insufficiency, renal failure. Those are contraindications where if you increase the amount of lymphatic flow in the case of untreated malignant diseases, there's concern that you can actually move cancer cells. With respect to acute inflammations, cellulitis is a prime example that Dr. Rao just talked about you don't want to do manual lymph drainage in the case of an acute inflammation or acute infection like cellulitis because you can in fact move that and, and move it very rapidly. Um, recent thrombosis, you can in fact, um, and the risk occurs with a deep vein thrombosis that you can in fact dislodge something and um, somebody can end up with a very serious situation. Cardiac insufficiency, um, um, cardiac, uh, heart problems where, especially in the case of congestive heart failure, um, where you can overload um, the fluid load on the heart and, and put someone in, in a very difficult cardiac situation. Or if you have a renal dysfunction and renal failure um, where you're pushing a lot of fluid then through the kidneys, um, it's another contraindication that you don't want to go there. The intensive phase um, begins with, with determining volume of, of the limb and um, we tend to take volume measurements um, 
if you notice here, every four centimeters, um, zero is taken at the medial malleolus, and then we take measurements on the, if this happens to be a leg, um, the, uh, the foot, and then every four centimeters up the limb to the top of the limb. And then uh, those are calculated um, squared, divided by pi, and you can actually get the volume of the limb. And we, in fact, measure the affected and unaffected side if it's a, a unilateral lymphedema, so that we can, in fact, um, know what kind of volume reductions we're getting. With the intensive phase, in our case, manual lymphatic drainage is the primary difference between combined decongestive therapy and compression therapy. Um, and we are, in fact, strong advocates of combined decongestive therapy. Manual lymphatic drainage is, is the real um, primary underpinning of that. And um, when we have somebody go through an intensive reductive phase um, with combined decongestive therapy, we're doing manual lymphatic drainage every day. It's a gentle rhythmical massage technique, um, and, and it's very, very gentle. Um, the weight of a nickel on your skin. Um, it's rhythmical, and it's focused on stimulating lymph flow and moving proteins and fluid into alternate watersheds. And, and we talked earlier about those different watersheds in the body and how you can actually move fluid between those different watersheds and, and, and proteins as well. Um, that's, I guess, in, in our view, the important thing because you need to change the physiology of the tissue in order to actually affect a long-term change in terms of lymphedema. If all you're doing is reducing the volume of a limb, but the protein levels are still there and continue to grow, then the osmotic pressure differential will continue to increase and the person will continue to um, struggle with maintaining the lymphedema. And, and I really agree with Heather in terms of getting people into regular manual lymph drainage sessions when you can for the purposes of reducing that protein load. Um, a study was done in, uh, in Salzburg. They looked at um, compression therapy and they reduced the limb by 33% in terms of the fluid volume, but the effect on the protein volume in that limb was only 3.6% reduction. So the actual physiology of the tissue wasn't changing considerably in, in the case of, of compression therapy alone. Um, that's the rate of, of increases of pulsations um, that you can get with manual lymph drainage. There's a variety of studies on the effectiveness of combined decongestive therapy that are out there that compare combined decongestive therapy being manual lymph drainage and compression with compression therapy alone. Um, the problem is with most of those is that they don't control the methodology of the manual lymph drainage and, and you can't be really certain what they're calling manual lymph drainage, whether it's just stroking of the skin or is it some particular methodology or technique. And also the patient populations aren't always comparable. So in my view, there is not a solid randomized control study without problems that is yet to be done. I, I think that any studies that we've seen, and even there's been some big ones uh, recently um, presented in, uh, in some cancer journals, and there, there's numerous problems with those. Can you um, reduce the protein by um, diet, or no? No. no? Manual of drainage is also the only therapeutic approach that addresses midline edemas. Now, we talked a little bit about lymph taping, which is a really good self-management technique with respect to that and can be coupled with it. But when you get into midline edemas like breast edemas, congenital edemas, head and neck edemas, chest wall edemas, how do you put compression on it? You still gotta breathe. A um, Couple of photos of, of uh, some manual lymph drainage on a leg and on an arm. Um, compression's important during the reductive phase and, and in our case, there's a number of bandaging techniques that, that we use. Um, in, in three, in fact, um, we use short stretch bandages, which are an elastic bandage with a high working pressure. So when you're wearing them and you start walking around in them, you're getting a lot more pressure. Um, we'll use long stretch bandages, which are elastic, which have a high resting pressure and a lower working pressure. And we'll also use Coban 2 bandages, which are an inelastic two layer um, bandage system. The four-layer bandage system is the most commonly used with combined decongestive therapy. 
Um, and the reason for that is, is you can adjust the amount of pressure that you're giving based on the number of layers that you add of the uh, short stretch and also the amount of stretch during the application. So um, where you've got an inelastic bandage system, the compression is actually controlled by the nature of the material you're working with. With a short stretch bandage, we can start with a lower compression for people that are more intolerant of compression and work to higher ones. Um, also, short stretch bandages are reusable and therefore they're suited to daily um, combined decongestive therapy because you can wash them and put them on again. Um, foam padding is initially wrapped over a cotton stocking before the stretch bandages are applied. And um, the toes and fingers are also wrapped with a molas gauze bandage um, so you're not getting um, swelling of the toes and fingers. Um, here's an um, actual uh, photo of, of somebody with a short stretch bandage on. You can see here the foam and the, uh, the cotton on the top and then this is the bandage system that you see. Uh, I'm actually taking it off at this point. With a long stretch bandage, it's applied directly over the cotton sleeve without any uh, foam padding. It's more commonly used on arms than legs. And um, we'll use it sometimes because it'll allow people to use uh, wear regular footwear um, instead of a short stretch with, with the uh, thick, heavy foam padding. And it's often chosen as well for patients who have difficulty tolerating compression. So we'll use it with uh, oftentimes chronic venous insufficiencies or lipidemas a little more. Um, Coban 2 is an inelastic bandage system that we use. Um, it's a two layer rather than a four layer system. Um, it's an alternative to the shorter long stretch when clients can't attend daily sessions or when they have limited financial constraints or um, when they have an unusually large or irregular edema. Um, it tends to stay up better in my view, um, although many people argue that point with me, but I think it does. Um, although the bandages are more expensive and not reusable, um, the way in which we take the approach when we're using um, Coban is um, we only do six sessions over a two-week period rather than 12, so we can actually reduce the cost of it by using this, although we can't use the bandages, um, but that cost is saved because you don't see the therapist as much. It's also not usable, useful, we found, when we're achieving significant reductions in combination with manual lymph drainage. Um, we dealt with a client one time who had a very large leg edema. We did a manual lymph drainage session. We wrapped them with Coban 2 and three hours later we were able to take off the entire bandage system like a cast. She had reduced that much. So it didn't last um, at all. In fact, um, Jessica with 3M was there for that demonstration and uh, they had never seen it before. Um, one of the problems we've run into when we, we don't use Coban so early in treatment sometimes is because we get really big volume reductions on the front end and the, uh, the Coban doesn't last even a day and before we lose our compression. And also, uh, we also use it um, following the intensive phase sometimes if we're use it waiting for a custom garment. In the transition phase, it's sort of the time between we've gone through and intensively reduced somebody and they're not yet in a compression garment. Um, we have people come in on a weekly or bi-weekly basis um, and uh, we want to continue to stimulate the lymphatic drainage. We want to check that their garment's fitting properly if they've got them in an off-the-shelf one, for instance, while we're waiting for a custom one. Um, and we want to measure their lem volumes and review their exercises, self-management techniques. And at this point, this is when we often um, do the lymph taping and, and teach people how to apply it. We then get into a maintenance phase that um, we have the advantage of offering because it's a private service. Um, 20 years of our experience has shown us that clients who receive regular manual lymph drainage have less problems managing their lymphedema. Um, they just do. Uh, they don't, they don't uh, in fact, we've got a number of clients that have gone back after a number of years of getting regular man lymph drainage and have been reassessed at, at the cross, for instance, and they say, if we reassessed you today, we wouldn't, we'd say you didn't have lymphedema. Um, they have less problems with their garments. Oftentimes, they don't wear them full-time any longer. Um, 
and uh, it just seems to be a much better situation. And also clients that have a more difficult time maintaining their um, gains that they got during the reductive phase also benefit a lot from getting manu regular manual lymph drainage because um, it, it seems to be a bit of a, a struggle sometimes with some edemas to, to keep them at bay. Generally clients receive either bi-weekly or monthly MLD sessions um, as a, in the maintenance phase. We encourage them to wear compression on a daily basis. And um, we get into providing exercises that are gentle, rhythmical, specific to their condition. Um, and I'm going to sort of skip through this because it's, it's pretty straightforward, the, uh, the kinds of things that we do with them. Simple, rhythmical, gentle exercises, whether it's an arm thing or even, you know, if you're with a leg edema, you're standing and rocking on the soles, of the, your balls of your feet. All you're looking at doing is creating a gentle rhythmical pulsation of the muscles to move that. CDT results vary um, based on individual's physiological condition, the extent of lymphatic damage, and the individual's compliance with the protocols. Um, as a result of that, we're always reluctant to provide an estimate of the success of any particular individual can expect. People ask all the time, you know, how much is my edema going to go down? Um, how, and I can't really answer that on an individual by individual basis because it depends on how damaged your system was, uh, how repeatedly damaged it's been from reoccurrences, um, whether or not um, your alternate pathways are open more readily than others. Um, we've even got physiological or anatomical differences in terms of us. There's a radial pathway that goes up over the shoulder in about 60% of the population. If you're one of those 60% that have that, you're going to have less of a difficult time maintaining your lymphedema than if you're in the 40% that doesn't have it. Um, with 20 years of experiences, we've seen many successes in reducing both the volume of lymphedema and reducing tissue fibrosis. And um, while some clients have experienced a complete reduction in their lymphedema, that is not the norm. Our clinical statistics after a single series, um, which is 12 to 14 sessions, range from, from an 8.5% reduction to a 100% reduction with the average reductions that we're experiencing being 63%. Uh, and, and those are really very good numbers. What's an investment in CDT costs? This is a private service. A typical 12 session series with short stretch bandaging costs about $1,500. Um, a CDT series using Coban costs approximately 900 because it requires half the MLD sessions. And we're currently in the process of, of, of determining whether or not those different approaches provide similar results because I'm not sure if they do or not yet. Um, <coughs> while we recognize that cost may be a barrier, um, these are the two reasons we really <coughs> opened a private clinic in Edmonton in 2011 um, because at the time we wanted to provide best practices lymphedema therapy and because we wanted to allow patients an option to longer wait lists and strict therapeutic protocols. Um, we're not restricted by those um, because of the private nature of this service. I just want to show you a couple of uh, before and afters and we'll wrap this thing up. Um, this was a post-accident crush injury. Um, somebody was run over by a car. And um, this is uh, a before and after of a 12-day series of uh, manual lymph drainage and combined decongestive therapy. This is a primary lymphedema um, that actually this photo was taken after we'd gotten through the reductive phase and um, it, had, it had reduced about 50% at this point from what she started with. Um, and this is following the CDT. The amazing part of this, and I'm just going to show you this next slide because I want to show you a peek at the future. Um, this is what she looks like now after going through um, lymph vessel transplant and debulking um, following the CDT. We reduced her in Edmonton as far as we could. We then arranged for her to go to Munich, Germany. Um, she went to the Wittlinger Clinic first and then saw Dr. Bullmeister in Germany. He transplanted two lymphatic vessels 
from her right leg to her left leg, each the size of a human hair. Um, she then came back. We measured her for 14 months, during which time she reduced another two liters as the new lymph vessels were working. She then went back and they debulked her lower leg um, because she'd had a lot of, of fat laid down in this area um, after that. And she now, although she has to um, be in compression um, during the day, um, both of her light legs are within 200 milliliters of each other. That's all I got to show you. Any uh, quick questions? I know we're running over here. We, um, we discourage people to be in a lot of heat, like in hot tubs, in saunas, um, in those kinds of things, because it increases the amount of inflammation, it increases the amount of fluid into the tissue. Um, so you've already got an overloaded system. Um, in terms of ice, I guess it depends on how localized, if you're talking about just icing an area or whether you're talking generally being in, in an icy environment. Anything that causes an increase in blood flow into that area is probably going to be stressing the lymphatic system. So, uh, okay. all right. Do you teach acid therapy? I really promote it. Um, I, I think that, um, and I covered it last week when we were talking about it, if you can get in the water, um, every centimeter below the surface of the water, the pressure increases 0 0.069 millimeters of mercury. So the amount of compression you've got on your lower legs and feet is higher than a compression garment we could put you in. So I'm a big advocate of getting in the water. All righty, I think it's a wrap. You know what, I, I don't think so. I think that, that you can get gains. Um, how, how much gains you can get, I'm not sure. I worked on a woman one time, she was 30 years with an arm edema after breast cancer. Her arm was huge. She had never had any compression on it, she'd never had any treatment of it. It was hard. Um, within 14 days of combined decongestive therapy, her arm volume had reduced 50% and her, her skin had softened. So, you know what, I have a lot of hope in the human body. <laughs>